I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In this week's episode, we're talking about how an investing newsletter called The Daily Upside got to 300,000 subscribers. When Patrick Truesdale launched his newsletter, The Daily Upside, in 2019, he didn't have much of a personal brand to build from. In fact, even today, his personal Twitter account has fewer than 300 followers. What he did have was several years of experience in finance and the willingness to grind out the newsletter each day, even when it didn't have much of a following. That kind of persistence netted him his first few hundred followers, and it also helped him get his foot in the door so he could pitch The Motley Fool, a popular finance website, on a content partnership. That partnership paid off in a big way, and the daily upside quickly grew by tens of thousands of signups. Today, the newsletter has over 300,000 subscribers and has sold out its ad inventory for months in advance. In our interview, Patrick walked me through his initial launch strategy, his business model, and how he convinced editors at The Motley Fool to take a chance on a partnership with an unknown entity. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk about this week's sponsor. That sponsor is the CEX Creator Economy Expo. It takes place from May 2nd to the 4th at the Arizona Grand Resort in Phoenix. It's an event dedicated to individual content creators and small media companies. Over 40 sessions will help you grow your audience, drive new revenue lines, sharpen up content operations, and teach you about Web3 business models. The event is limited to just 500 people and includes amazing speakers like the New York Times five times bestseller Dan Pink, TikTok Twitch star Leash Capiche, Anne Handley, Joe Polizzi, Roberto Blake, and 30 other world-class content slash media entrepreneurs. Plus, attendees get all the recordings as well. Sign up today and get your all-access pass and $200 off the already low rate by going to cex.events and use coupon code SIMON. That's cex.events and coupon code S-I-M-O-N. And there's a pretty good chance that I'll actually be attending this event, so if you're going, definitely reach out so we can schedule coffee or drinks. Okay, on to my interview with Patrick. Hey, Patrick, thanks for joining us. Hey, Simon, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So you founded a business-focused newsletter called The Daily Upside. Your background originally was in investment banking, correct? That's correct. I worked in investment banking uh, at one large bank, Bank of America, and then a, a boutique bank, Guggenheim Securities, And I was working on media and technology deals while at Guggenheim. um, And that was a large part of what inspired me to actually take the dive and and start working on building a media company. So a company would come to you and say, hey, we're, you know, we've had several rounds of investment. We think we're ready to either, we we don't want to IPO, but we think we're ready to sell to a larger company we want you to help like basically create some kind of presentation for us, take us on as a client and put us in front of buyers and negotiate that and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's pretty much right. I mean, these relationships evolve over, frankly, years. It's not like you typically just get a call out of a blue uh, from someone from a stranger who wants to sell their business. Typically for call it the size of businesses that Guggenheim would would interact with, the relationships do develop over time. And were you happy in investment banking? Was this something you wanted to get out of? I, I liked a lot uh, about the work in investment banking, the analytical work, dissecting businesses was a big part of the role, trying to figure out <clears throat> what makes them profitable, what makes them able to, to grow, how is it differentiated in the marketplace. So I, I liked all of that. But at the end of the day, I did want to focus more on being on the other side of the table, working on actually growing a business from the ground up was something that pretty much for the entire duration of my career in investment banking that I wanted to, to do. So it took about a, a decade to build up the courage, but finally got there. And when did you start thinking about launching a newsletter and why a newsletter? Yeah, so I, when I was covering the, the media and technology space, I'd seen newsletters emerge as a, a pretty attractive model for, for launching a media business, right? Not a lot of CapEx out of the gate, um, you know, pr- pretty tried and true distribution channels to, to acquire readers and frankly, just 
easier than trying to build up domain authority over the course of many years to to build an audience. So I, I looked at newsletters as um, you know a good model within media. And once I decided on that, I, I left Guggenheim um, and, and pretty much started working on it right away. And you were looking at, and I have a lot of people on, like this on the podcast, you were looking at newsletters like Morning Brew, The Hustle, The Skim, right? These kinds of uh, kind of breezy, conversational, business-focused uh, newsletters, right? Those are all amazing companies that in their early days, early years, made an a amazing amount of progress and got an amazing amount of traction without a ton of capital. So absolutely was inspired by those companies. I personally wanted to build a product for investors specifically. And those companies you mentioned all do a great job uh, with their product. I think my idea, and it's still the purpose of, of the company, is to try to go a layer or two deeper on the stories we cover, the companies we cover, and draw out insights that, in theory, could help investors frame their point of view about the world. So that's that's our angle. And did you quit your job before launching the Daily Upside? I did. And <laughs> looking back, that was probably the, the biggest mistake because, as you know, I'm sure it it, uh, it does take quite a while to get the ball rolling and, and to build traction. Newsletters are great, but it is a high-friction product. It does not ignite overnight. I didn't start the Daily Upside with, you know, 100,000 Twitter followers, for instance, that I could just convert um, into readers. So it was slow going for six, nine months where relative to what I was doing before, it was, you know, uh, <laughs> a little bit of a come down. Yeah, I don't know. But I've written about this in my own newsletter, though, is you kind of have to go all in. Like you can't run something as a side hustle, even if you're not making enough money to, to replace your salary. And I don't know, it seems like, you, and we'll get into this, but it seems like you're successful now. Like, don't you think you needed those like six to 12 months of just grinding it out, you know, thinking about it on a full-time basis? Oh, I, I, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. There, there would have been no way, especially with the daily product, to be, you know, working a full-time job, but also producing content that was worth reading for, for subscribers. And I think a big part of any newsletter journey is, figuring out how exactly you're, you're going to be different than the other newsletters that exist. How does the product work? How does the editorial process work in terms of story selection? Um, and you don't, <laughs> you can think about it all you want going in, but the only real way to do it is to just strap in and get going. And so you ended up launching the newsletter in 2019, like around what month? The end of September of 2019, we launched the first newsletter to, so you just passed a two-year anniversary for it. So what did the format of the newsletter look like in the early days? I'd say the early days were slightly different. We were slightly less news and events focused than we are now. In the early days, I was picking an individual company that I had either covered in my investment banking days or uh, had, had known about and would kind of go through all the issues of, of that company and do, frankly, even slightly more of a deep dive than we're doing now. But it was less less news focused. I quickly I call it two or th you were like a stock analyst. It was more like stock analysis in in the first two months. Yeah. And I quickly realized while I enjoy doing this, if someone's going to open up this newsletter every day, there has to be some connection to current events, or it's it, there's going to be some level of fatigue. Uh -huh. And so two months in, it how did it transform? <clears throat> two months in, I. I started looking at the various models out there, the, how the other newsletters were covering business news. And I basically wanted to morph what I was doing, which is more stock analysis um, and company focused news and marry it with the news. And that's really the product that still exists today, which is we're covering <coughs> stories that you, you might read about in the journal, um, but go again, a level or two deeper and frame it in a perspective for investors. But I think what also sets us apart from some other newsletters is we'll surface stories that you're likely not going to find unless you are reading the Financial Times cover to cover every single day. And we'll sur surface those stories and figure out how we can add value, combine it, combine it with other trends that we know are happening in the market and provide value that way to readers. 
Yeah, so I was looking at the newsletter before we got on today. It looks like you have like a, like a handful, three to four stories. You're devoting a couple hundred words to each story, giving some some analysis, some context, stuff like that, right? Yep, we've got three main stories in our in our weekday newsletter. Last month, we launched the weekend newsletter, which is essentially a deeper dive into a theme that would be important to someone who follows business and markets. We covered last weekend, we covered trends shaping the home improvement industry. So obviously folks kind of know what happened during the pandemic, but what is likely going to happen next? Um, and what does that mean for folks like Home Depot, Lowe's, and whose possession, who's position best to kind of thrive in, in the next next era here? So, you, you know, early on in your days, you eventually formed a partnership with The Motley Fool, which was kind of like a game changer for you. But before that, what was your, how were you finding an audience or were you not finding an audience? Like, were you just struggling to, you know, figure out how to grow the newsletter? Yeah, I mean, there was in the early days when I first set out some level of just organic growth based on who was reading it. Um, I'd say, you know, we started in the first newsletter went out to probably 200, 200 folks. I'd say through January, February of 2021, we were probably up to around two or 3000 readers, but I was devoting so much of my time to just producing content to satisfy the existing readers <laughs> that I did quickly start, uh, changing my fr- frame of reference to figure out how to kind of in a, in a meaningful way, scale the operation. Um, and that did lead, yeah. lead to the partnership. So you went over a whole, like over a whole year of writing the newsletter before that partnership. <laughs> I did, but um, I did call it start having conversations in January or February of 2021. Uh-huh. I talked to three or four major media companies and, you know, had interest. I call it in varying degrees. Some liked the product and wanted to kind of in-house the daily upside and have me to basically become a writer full time at, you know, an an established publication. I did contemplate raising, raising capital. I had a couple conversations around that, but ultimately I was connected with the right person at the Molly Fool. Well, let's, let's not get into, let's wait just to get into that. I just wanted to explore a few other things is like, so like you, you said you had two to 3000 subscribers before you formed that partnership. And most, a lot of newsletter writers who are listening to this and say, you know, 2000 to 3000 uh, readers for a newsletter that you started from scratch, you had no pre existing brand before then. Like that's actually like not that easy to do. Um, you know, I, I, I know the landscape, like, obviously if you're starting with a hundred thousand Twitter followers and a big following in media, like you can get that very easy, but starting from scratch, that's definitely difficult. Were people like forwarding the newsletter? How were they, how were they coming across it? There was definitely some of that. I'd say from the first 200 called family and friends in the first month where people were, you know, it was a novel idea, a novel product. I'd say that got us up to you know, well over 750, close to a thousand, just on pure sharing with friends. Um, and then kind of that, excuse me, um, you, you know, network effect of people sharing with one or two friends and it, and it, and it grows a little bit from there. We, in the early days, I, I did experiment with paid marketing. I kind of knew some good channels to advertise to start the, um, virtuous cycle of, ha- of having the brand get out there. So, we partnered with influencers on Instagram and launched a handful of ads there. And we found really from day one, good value um, in order to, to grow the list. Yeah. And, but two to 3000, that's, that's decent. If you're like starting to launch, like maybe a paid newsletter with the idea you could convert like five to 10% and grow from there. But you're, you were always intending to be this, to be an advertising um uh, pub, like, and we'll get into the business model a little bit, but like you always wanted to be advertising funded, in which case you needed a lot more scale than 3000. Like you needed to grow much more quickly, right? I always intended this to be, <clears throat> excuse me, an advertising model. So yeah, from the early days, I knew the basic math of, of what CPMs were available and called the finance and business market, what that meant from a, how large does the audience need to get in order to sustain a business. So from the very, very early days, I was focused on how the audience could get, you know, north of 50, 100, 200,000 readers. 
Yeah. So in in January, February, you said you started like talking to different media companies. A lot of them you talked to were probably probably from based on what you're saying is like they were like, oh, this is kind of cool. You're a good writer. How about you come write a newsletter or write for us or something like that? But you wanted to somehow stay independent. And so most of these deals didn't work. But you eventually started talking to someone at The Motley Fool. How did that conversation go? Yeah. So it was uh, a, a fortunate reality that I happened to email the right person at The Motley Fool, a gentleman named John Keeling who runs business development. I introduced myself, introduced the newsletter and my background, and I'm sure he subscribed, read it for a couple of days and, and reached back out. And you know, we started a conversation about the newsletter, where I saw it going. And we ended up meeting really right before the pandemic in, in New York in February and got to know each other a little bit more along with someone else who works at, at The Fool and started discussing what a partnership could look like. Yeah, I'm wondering, like, you know, from his point of view, he had just seen the success. This is, you know, beginning of 2021. He had succeed. He had seen the success of sites like the the Skim or uh, the Hustle, um, Morning Brew, and maybe he was looking at this and saying, "This is my chance to get in on to get in early on one of these companies." Uh, that are one of these newsletters that are that have a lot of potential to grow very quickly. So talk to me about the arrangement you came to eventually. Yep. So the first thing we did was, <laughs> while they could read the product, they did need to, did want to evaluate whether or not their audience would engage with it. Was it, would the content resonate? So the first thing we did was a trial that lasted five or six months that basically involved the Molly Fool opting in a certain number of readers through advertising on on their you know, uh, their funnels and subscribing to the Daily Upside, and then from there we evaluated open rates, click through rates, and just the overall feedback on the newsletter from folks in their organization. <clears throat> and it was a fortunate reality that last year during the pandemic there was a lot of business news. There was a lot of things happening in the markets, and frankly, a lot to unpack. From what's the Federal Reserve going to do, you know, during to level the economy during this unprecedented crisis, to just the natural gyrations that were happening in the stock market. So the engagement was off the charts from from day one. We saw forty to fifty percent unique open rates. We weren't selling ads, but click through rates on articles we would recommend were were very strong. So at the end of that process, they. Well, just to translate what you're saying, so they, the Motley Fool, is an established like finance news type of uh, media company, has a huge email list, and they were they were like picking some subset of their list, right, and sending a dedicated standalone email saying, you know, here's this other newsletter, here's a link where you can opt into it. Like that's how it worked, right? That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. And so you saw, and then you were giving them access to your analytics and you, they were seeing that a very large percentage of their uh, readership was not only converting to your newsletter, but was opening 40, 50% of the, you know, having a 40 to 50% open rate. And uh, what did the Motley Fool get out of this arrangement? I think as you alluded to before, they saw the potential of of what this could become. They work with a lot of newsletters as part of their regular marketing act, marketing activities. So they were definitely aware of how large newsletters could get as a channel. And ultimately they, they're very smart marketers and they uh, knew that this ultimately could be in time, a good funnel for their, for their products as well. So for them, it was as much of an experiment as it, as it still was for me. Um, and, and, but but a business arrangement came out of it. Like they're selling advertising on your newsletters and getting a cut. They also invested, right? Yep. So we at the end of that six or seven seven month trial period, we struck a deal where they made a modest investment in in the daily upside, and we have kind of a a marriage economic relationship where we're both incentivized to see the newsletter do well, generate ad revenue. And yeah. And so how many signups did that partnership drive? So you had two to 3000 uh, when it started over that six month engagement. How, how big did your, did your list grow? So we went from that two to 3000, I mentioned to 40,000 by the time we struck the, the partnership in August. And that wasn't all Motley Fool. I mean, a, a large chunk of it was, but 
We were also starting our own paid marketing activities. Once we built more critical mass and our work started getting out there a little bit more, we had more organic traffic. So I'd say on that first seven months, we had roughly 60% of our traffic come from Motley Fool. Yeah. So you got out of that one partnership, not only did you get an investor, but you got like 10x growth in a six month period, pretty much. Yep. That's that's the way I would characterize it. And and Simon, it was also the right readers that were going to be engaged with with the content. I mean, despite the fact that a lot of them came without really knowing what the content was going to be, we've seen, again, continued strong engagement from folks that, that on board because Mo- Molly Fool is a trusted brand in financial media. Folks are looking to consume this type of investing in business content. So the overlap was from the very outset, pretty, pretty, pretty strong. And so you've since grown it from 40,000 to, I think, over 100,000. And you settled on a growth strategy where you're basically, you know, buying ads on other newsletters. How does that strategy work exactly? Yep. So right now we're sitting with 160,000 subscribers. We we have a, a, a pretty wide net we cast in terms of marketing and growing the newsletter. In the early days, we were doing a lot of swaps with other newsletters, basically cross-promoting on a cash-free basis with other audiences that that <coughs> could resonate. Um, at this point, we probably do more buying on other on other newsletters than than swaps, but we still do swaps with certain partners. We we do a lot of paid marketing on the large platforms, Facebook, TikTok, and engagement and quality of audience is certainly lower there, but this the scale at which you can reach audiences is, is just much larger. People are spending an inordinate amount of time on TikTok. So if that's where people are, it's a good place to good place for us to advertise. And like TikTok, obviously finance TikTok is big. Are you getting like influencers to recommend to create like like videos, branded videos where they recommend your newsletter or is it mainly just using like TikTok's ad system? It's it's definitely been both. I think the good thing about our story is we're kind of a scrappy media upstart and that resonates with a lot of creators on TikTok, on Instagram. So when, when we reach out to creators, it's not as some big stodgy brand. It's as kind of fellow creators, right? We're a small company. So We've had a lot of success developing personal relationships with with other people, creating content and striking creative ways to promote one another. I mean, we'll sometimes we will almost license some of our content or story ideas. A TikTok creator will make a video about it as if they came up with the story or the content, but then give us kind of a shout out at the end of the video because it is was our kind of uh, legwork that that made the script, and that's that's been a great growth strategy for us. And for the newsletters that you buy ads in, is it just a call to action, just describing the value proposition of the daily upside and saying go sign up here? Or you, and I know I know that some newsletter when they say that newsletters who advertise in other newsletters, like they say the winning strategy is actually to send them directly to a piece of content and get them hooked that way versus a more generic call to action. What have you settled on as the most effective uh, conversion method? We've settled on sending people, excuse me, straight to our, our landing page. I mean, we do give a lot of information in the copy about who our readers are, what kind of information are we providing? So the folks that's that end up on the landing page are pretty qualified and from other newsletters we see very high landing page conversion rates so that's been our our strategy and you also have a referral loyalty program how does that work we do we we basically incentivize people to share the newsletter the first rung on the tier is getting access to our sunday newsletter uh, and then we also <clears throughat> incentivize people with with um, things like mugs and t-shirts. I, I think we can do generally a, a much better job with, with that than we have done. To be honest, it hasn't represented a massive portion of our growth. I'd say on balance, our readers are slightly older than some of the other newsletters you mentioned. So I don't think there's that same inherent level of oh, I'm going to get very excited to share this newsletter to get a T-shirt, for instance. Um, 
as maybe someone right, you know, in college or out of college. So I think we're, we're yeah. still tweaking and, and kind of fine tuning our referral program. And I'm sure most of my listeners know this, but how these work is they can generate a personalized URL that allows you to, so when they share that URL and people sign up for the newsletter, it tracks back to them, it gives them points, and then they can exchange those points for different rewards. Sometimes there's something virtual, like access to a Facebook group, or like you said, access to a special Sunday newsletter, or it's physical, like, you know, receiving mugs and and uh, and t-shirts and stuff in the mail. Uh, so one of the rewards, the basic rewards, is you get access to the Sunday deep dive newsletter you produce. That's the only way to get access to that newsletter, right? So Simon, we did actually just pivot to launching the Sunday newsletter to to all readers because it is frankly now probably our highest value to our readers. Um, so we are kind of in the midst of restructuring our, our referral program around that tier. I should be clear on that. Oh, so you're sending the Sunday deep dive to all 160,000 signups. We are. Uh huh. Oh, okay. That's interesting because I did have some questions about, you know, obviously when you were doing it as a referral program, um, it's it's a much smaller base because it's people who have you know gotten at least three people to sign up for the newsletter. But it seems like those would be your super fans. They would have a super high engagement rate, and you could maybe even sell advertising at like higher CPMs or something. But it sounds like you just weren't seeing enough ROI, and it wasn't worth it to do it that way. Yeah, I mean, ultimately we were producing kind of two thousand, <laughs> excuse me, two thousand, three thousand word articles and deep dives that gave a lot of value to the audience. And we, you know, while we we could send that to a smaller subset, you know, the three, 400 that have referred at least three people. Ultimately we, we want to give as much value as we can to all of our, our, all of our readers. So we did change that strategy. I noticed that. So like we said that you have, you'll have like three individual stories within the daily newsletter. I've noticed that all the individual segments, the individual stories within the newsletter are now published as articles on the website as well. Is that so you can capitalize on things like SEO and social sharing? It is. That that was the original intent was the social sharing component. So on our newsletter, we have social sharing icons and we do see people engage with those. They'll, they'll read a story, decide they want to share it on Facebook or Twitter. And that was the reason we created the individual stories. It does add a significant amount of work for a small team to, to you know, port the content over to WordPress. But it is for us worth it to build the SEO credibility over time, build the domain authority, and ultimately build more organic traffic is the, the, where we're looking to go. And when did you start to create, like, when did you start creating web article versions of the newsletter? Around four four months ago, we made the transition uh-huh. to, to start to do that. And honestly, it's going to be a very large initiative for us in the coming months is how can we optimize to make sure we're getting the most value out of our you know, three to 400 word articles. Um, so that's going to be a big focal point. Do you have any ambitions to get into any kind of original reporting or breaking news or anything like that? <clears throat> I think our differentiation will likely not be breaking news. I think where we'll, we will thrive is providing the insights and color and analysis on breaking on the breaking news stories that, that matter. Um, so I, I don't think we're ever, just based on how our newsroom is set up, we're ever going to be first to be able to get a story out. We're never, never going to be first to be able to show up number one on Google News. But I think we're looking to build a brand that people can trust where after the dust is settled, if you want the, a, a thorough, comprehensive analysis of what has happened, a trusted brand to do that for financial news. Do you see yourself ever getting into like competition for hiring with like the Bloomberg's, the Wall Street Journal's, the Business Insider's, like bringing on actual writer brands or do you want it to stay centered on the Daily Upside brand? I think ultimately it will be important for our writers to have personalities and that are very public. And frankly, our writers do um, have personalities that are, that are public who have large Twitter followings and are, are kind of entities in the journalism world. I don't think we've leaned into that as a brand as hard as we should have, but that just comes with being a small company and being focused on, 
you know, a limited number of things as, as small companies are. How have you gone about hiring? Like how's, how is the Daily Upside now staffed? So we have a, a full-time writer named Sean, Sean Craig. He's based in Berlin and we started working together. He was a contributing writer for three or four months. And ultimately he joined full-time earlier this year when we kind of were fully on the same page in terms of content vision for the business. And we both bought into that. Um, we have a number of other contributing writers and editor. <laughs> we have a, a growth marketing uh, manager and an ad operations specialist who helps coordinate relationships with our sponsors. So let's talk about those sponsors. When did you first start selling advertising for the newsletter? So we didn't, <coughs> excuse me, Simon, we didn't sell advertising until early 2021. So January or February of 2021 was the first time we sold an ad. And as we were talking about before, we, we did have a pretty sizable audience, you know, at the end of 2020, where we could have sponsors in the newsletter. We made a conscious effort to just focus solely on content, uh, really just as a virtue of, of headcount until we got to a certain critical mass. Uh huh. And so like, do you, are you selling ads directly? Is Motley Fool selling those ads? Yep. So we're selling all, uh, I'd say roughly 75% of our ads ourselves. And we work with a number of agencies um, and talented professionals throughout the space who have spooled up their own operations to sell the other chunk of ads. And are you writing the copy in-house? We are. Yep. Our ad operations uh, employee helps, helps write copy. And I'm also heavily involved with copy as well. And what kind of like, in terms of you had a pie chart of the different kinds of advertisers, how much are like consumer versus B2B versus investing, different things like that kind of brands? Investing and finance has been our, definitely our most successful um, sponsor cohort. I'd say they represent around 60% of our sponsorships. And we do around 20% of consumer goods and 20% B2B. And you've you've uh, sold out your inventory for what, the rest of the year? <clears throat> we are sold out for the rest of 2021. We did recently launch a secondary ad slot in the newsletter. And we are kind of selling that sparingly throughout the rest of the year. But it, our primaries are sold out for yep, the next two and a half months. And we have brand, brands kind of knocking on our door all day long to try to get inventory for, you know, for Q1. So from a brand perspective, we, we have seen a lot of demand for newsletters. And frankly, we, we hear the same across the space. Um, there's, there are many great newsletters, but there's only, and we're not one of them yet, but there's only so many scaled newsletters where you can reach hundreds of thousands of, of the right audience that these brands are trying to reach. Yeah. I mean, you say you're not one of them, Yet a lot of my readers would be like, what well, you know, 160,000 seems like a lot of scale. What kind of scale do you feel like you need to get to when you uh, get to before you're in the league of newsletters you want to be with? I'm certainly not trying to diminish ourselves or or anyone with any audience size. Um, I merely mean it's it's a lot of the brands we work with, frankly, will not will have difficulty working with us at our size because they're accustomed to spending a million dollars a month on YouTube where working with an audience our size is great and we can drive leads, but it, it does take a lot of manpower to to manage these one-off relationships. So <clears throat> I think, you know, once you get into the call it north of 500,000, I think you can, you can work with different types of sponsors. Do you have any plans to diversify revenue at all? Like on obviously with now you publishing a lot of articles to the web, there's the opportunity for just programmatic advertising, which a lot of, a lot of publishers think of newsletter publishers think of as like low hanging fruit of just getting extra supplemental revenue. Uh, obviously there's the opportunity for a daily podcast. There's paid subscriptions. What are you thinking about? Like in terms of a revenue mix? I, I think we're, we're laser focused on, our daily newsletter at the moment, I think it's very easy to look at, you know, the different avail the different avenues you could go down from podcast to paid product to building out programmatic and trying to scale the web presence. But 
I think the strength of a lot of these businesses, including the ones you mentioned earlier in the interview, is just being uber focused on one product. Having that being a complete must read day in and day out is what drives a lot of success for newsletter brands is, is not losing focus. So I think that's where our head is at for at least the next 12 months. And uh, do, so you have like a 160,000 followers. How do you interact with your audience? Like if someone replies to one of the emails, who is that going to? Or is someone responsible for replying to those people? Yep. Someone is <laughs> is absolutely responsible for, for replying. I'd say <laughs> pretty quickly we're going to need to <laughs> have that be a formal role. Um, depending on what, we're, what we write, if we write something controversial, we write something about tax as we did today. We'll get 30, 40 replies on the email. And I'm replying to a lot of those today. And I, you know, we have a lot of the same people emailing day in and day out and feeling like they have a relationship with the newsletter, which is great, which is what we want. But it is, it is becoming a workflow. Okay, Patrick. Well, those are all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? So check out The Daily Upside. We're, if you Google us, we'll be right there at the top. We're at www.thedailyupside.com. Awesome. Well, it's a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Simon. Okay. Thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay. See you next week.